Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Office of New Haven Affairs slash Yale University's monthly community breakfast. We hold these breakfasts on the first Thursday of the month um, uh, during the academic year. Uh, welcome to our February, bre our February breakfast, and um, we have an exciting speaker again for you. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, just a few announcements before we get started. Um, uh, this month, the um, Yale School of Medicine's Office of Diversity um, equity and inclusion is um, hosting its first annual Black History Month film series. This film series is open to the public. It is virtual. Um, each uh, they'll be showing one film per week, and um, each film will be followed by a, dis a discussion led by a panel in which you can participate. So this is the registration uh, page. I will put this information in the chat so that you can sign up. The first. Uh, film shows tonight. Um, it, they're showing good hair tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, next week's uh, film is Through a Lens Darkly. Uh, the um, third week is Little Rock Central High, 50 years later. And the last film of the month is The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Again, you're more than welcome to join. You do need to register um, on the page and I will put that in the chat. Uh, there is a hardworking group of individuals that is the energy and, and engine behind the university's New Haven Hiring Initiative. They invite everyone to sign up for their newsletter. They regularly send out information about um, jobs that are available, um, including um, temporary positions if you, are, um, if you are interested in those positions as well. They are solely focused on hiring New Haven residents. So please sign up for the New Haven Hiring Initiative website. Um, and reach out to one of the members of the team. Um, their contact information will be in the newsletter. And finally, the university continues to up regularly update its COVID-19 um, website. We, this is where we post all of our stats for testing, as well as regular updates on what is going on on campus. Uh, I will put all this information in the chat. Um, on a related note, our speaker this morning is Dr. Saad Omer. Dr. Saad Omer is the inaugural director of the Yale Institute for Global Health. He is also professor of infectious diseases at the Yale School of Medicine and the professor of epidemiology of microbial diseases at the Yale School of Public Health. Dr. Omer has conducted studies in countries around the world and his research portfolio includes epidemiology of respiratory viruses such as influenza, RSV, and more recently COVID-19 clinical trials to estimate efficacy of maternal and or infant influenza, pertussis, polio, measles, and pneumococcal vaccines, and trials to evaluate drug regimens to reduce mother to child transmission of HIV. Moreover, he has conducted several studies on interventions to increase immunization coverage and acceptance. His work has also included public health preparedness strategies to effectively respond to large emerging and re-emerging infectious disease outbreaks. Dr. Omer has published widely in peer-reviewed journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, Lancet, British Medical Journal, and the American Journal of Public Health. He has also written op-eds for publications such as the New York Times, Politico, and the Washington Post. Dr. Omer has received multiple awards, including the Maurice Hilleman Award by the National Foundation of Infectious Diseases, for his work on the impact of maternal influenza immunization on respiratory illness, illness in infants younger than six months for whom there is no vaccine. Dr. Omer has served on several advisory panels, including the US National Vaccine Advisory Committee, Presidential Advisory Committee on Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria and the Vaccine Innovation Working Group, and the WHO Expert Advisory Group for Healthcare Worker Vaccination. He also served as an academic affiliate of the Office of Evaluation Sciences, formerly known as the White House Social and Behavioral Sciences team. Please help me welcome Dr. Saad Omar. Hi, it's good to be back. Uh, would be happy to share my slides. Uh, let me see. I'm assuming everyone can see my slides. Yes. Okay, wonderful. So I will be going through a few slides and then open up for questions and discussion because I, I suppose you know a lot of information coming out has been a bit confusing uh, to people. So I will go through the provide a snapshot and then we'll discuss where we are going, uh, and then uh, we'll have a bit of a discussion. So right now this is the reported cases in the U.S. starting in February 2020, 
uh, through February 2022, or actually, yeah, late January, starting in late January through now. And as you can see that we have had, uh, you know, we thought uh, it was a huge outbreak in March, April 2020. Uh, then came the surge of the last winter. Then there was a, you know, uh, nationally, there was a, uh, an increase in, um, in cases uh, in fall, uh, late summer, fall 2020 as well, although Connecticut actually avoided that. But we weren't spared by the last winter surge. And then we had a decline through the summer. And then we had uh, even, uh, we have had two surges uh, in cases uh, this was the Delta surge, which uh, a lot of us argue was uh, uh, preventable, at least not completely, but to a large extent. And we can discuss, we can have a discussion what we could have done uh, as a country. I think we, the state did a, a reasonable job, uh, but I think at the, at the national level, we could have done a better job. Uh, and then we had this Omicron increase. And, and just to remind folks, uh, this we heard about this new variant over the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, and uh, some of us still have uh, Thanksgiving turkey and leftovers in our freezer. Uh, and, and, and so and we've had this, not only the surge and it's, it's now declining, but that decline is a bit nuanced and I will, I'll, I'll discuss uh, you know, what is the implications on hospitalization and deaths, et cetera. This surge was very substantial. So unlike previous surges, it was almost uniform. Uh, in all regions, including our region. Um, the, the Northeast increase came a little bit early. And, and part of the reason is that we have this uh, big city called New York, uh, which is the most connected city in the world, uh, connected city in, in the US at least. There are a couple of more connected city outside the US uh, and it's densely populated and has a city with a lot of inequities. Uh, and so therefore we are, uh, this regions, uh, uh, Epidemiology is impacted by New York, but also we are generally a more dense region than the rest of the country. But we have our increase and then decline uh, earlier than a lot of uh, other regions, but all regions saw that increase. And we will be seeing um, sort of, uh, you know, this epidemiology play out. Here's the thing I will caution against, uh, and especially if you look at deaths and hospitalization, that often this looks like uh, an increase and, and, and decline, which it is. And the comparison we uh, do is through the Delta wave, which is the, the previous wave. But, but remember, this Delta wave was worse than last winter's pre-vaccination wave. So we have a vaccine and, and vaccines are working and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But, but these are pretty big body blows. And, and as if uh, you know, sometimes anchoring it to previous waves, uh, waves uh, makes it sound like as if uh, anything less bad um, uh, than what happened with the Delta wave or, or one of the previous waves is acceptable. Uh, remember, this was the first wave we saw. Uh, and remember, the Northeast was pretty much overwhelmed in March, April 2020, uh, despite lockdowns. We haven't had full on lockdowns and proper actual lockdowns since early uh, 2020. Since then, there have been policies on masking and vaccines and all of that stuff. Uh, but, but despite the lockdown, uh, the, this was a pretty big body blow to the state and we've had even worse uh, number of cases. So, so just in context that both the relative values and absolute values matter. The increase in admission in this wave, well, the pattern, the relative pattern was qualitatively overall similar for a lot of ages but compared to previous waves, compared to other age groups, children under 18 uh, had lower hospitalization rate uh, by age. And so, which is good. Uh, we know that the risk of hospitalization and death is lower in uh, children. But if you look at, compare it to the previous waves, it was a substantial increase. So if I blow that up uh, and remove all the other age groups, you will see that children had more hospitalization compared to uh, previous waves. So, so both of these things are true that compared to other age groups, children had lower uh, rates of hospitalizations, but compared to previous waves amongst children themselves, uh, selves, this was, you know, during the Omicron wave, uh, we had uh, an increase. So, uh,
So now we have new reported deaths by day. Um, and if you look at this, this is the this is a sad story. So we have heard that this new variant Omicron has lower uh, quote unquote severity, which is true per case. Our best estimates suggest that it's 75% uh, as severe in terms of hospitalizations and death uh, compared to the Delta variant, but Delta variant was more severe than Alpha and Beta and, uh, and some of the other variants. So, so keeping that in mind, we now are averaging approximately 2,500 deaths per day, which is very substantial. Um, we had in, uh, in, you know, in the last week or so, as many deaths as we had in the three flu seasons combined from flu, the full seasons in the last three, uh, three seasons. And if you go back further, you know, you, you know, we're having more deaths in a month than than many flu seasons combined. So, so keeping that in mind, our peak was this pre-vaccination around the time we started vaccinating. So around the, when we didn't have tools available, we are we have uh, you know 2,500 on average fellow Americans dying from this variant, even though it's less severe per case. But the fact that it is more infectious, meaning more uh, people are getting infected and are uh, regionally at least our hospitals were getting overwhelmed. Now the situation is getting better, and there's always a lag between someone who gets infected now. Um, you know, it, it, people who die, it takes time for them to uh, develop the interest, uh, the, develop the the, the 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 disease, get hospitalized, and then uh, unfortunately die. So, so keeping that in mind, the good news is uh, we we have pretty substantial protection against cases uh, if someone is fully vaccinated. So the current CDC definition of fully vaccinated is two doses of uh, mRNA vaccines or at least one dose of uh, J&J vaccine, although some, some of us believe that the J&J definition should be revised. But, but setting that aside, even without the booster, there is reduction in cases, lower cases, even in this pandemic. So um, uh, but the, the protection against death is even more substantial, even with two doses. Um, the national data are not available. We know that this protection uh, increases substantially, many fold if you have a booster as well, both against getting the, your likelihood of getting infected, but even more so for dying. So that's the good news, that while the cases are happening in those uh, who are vaccinated, they're happening uh, at a lower level and death and hospitalization is way more prevalent in those who are unvaccinated. And in, uh, especially the, the protection is much higher with, with boosting. Looking at cumulative cases. So what is the total story? What is the, you know, it, you know, because you see, uh, you know, one day that Florida is high or Connecticut is high, or you know, California versus Minnesota or Alaska, etc., and so on and so forth. What is the total experience so far in terms of number of cases cumulatively, uh, per, uh, you know, uh, you know, per share of population? So, so if you divide it by population and you say uh, how many people uh, were infected, uh, have been infected. From the start of this pandemic, you you see that there are hotspots. There are hotspots in uh, New York, but Connecticut has done reasonably well, even in number of cases. Uh, but even though we were hit earlier, uh, when we didn't have the tools to protect them, so March, April, twenty twenty was pretty substantial because New York was one of the early places uh, where we got the infection from. Even in terms of deaths, and especially in terms of death. Uh, uh, we have pretty substantial older population. Uh, the Northeast has done reasonably well, including New York, uh, yeah. because a lot of deaths was prevented after the first wave, although it was hit, uh, New York was hit pretty substantially in, in, in multiple waves. Uh, but there are other regions. It's just that the number, the population is more dense, the population is higher uh, in, in the Northeast, uh, then the numbers add up obviously, and, and any death is, whatever it happens is tragic, but there is a clustering uh, 
in the in the south, um, in especially the southeast, but also Texas, etc. Midwest was pretty, uh, you know, hardly hit. Uh, you have had uh, uh, substantial mortality in Michigan, et cetera, uh, and, and even uh, places like uh, New Mexico uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth, uh, and, and including Arizona as well. So how have we done as a country compared to other countries? So a lot of times we compare it to the UK, but I'll show a broader comparison. We have had more deaths than even countries like the UK. So, so you can say that for, well, let's say a country like Thailand, they're, they're, they have a younger population. Um, and that is a big, you know, when, when, when age is a big factor, many fold higher risk of uh, mortality due to age is a risk factor. Uh, you know, obviously you're gonna see more uh, mortality in, in places that have older populations and the US has one of the older populations, but, but still compared to countries like ours um, or, or reasonably similar to ours, we have done worse. Uh, we did really bad last winter. Um, and we didn't do well uh, in terms of deaths, uh, even during the Omicron surge. Um, the UK deaths uh, uh, have plateaued in terms of new reported deaths uh, per week and adjusting for population. But if you look at the cumulative deaths uh, and, and that experience, uh, the US, uh, you know, on the left panel, the US was towards the higher side of the pack uh, throughout the pandemic, started from the middle, and others were able to have a better control. And, and you know, one big surprise, and I work in multiple countries and both in high and, and low income countries, one surprise is France compared to the US. Uh, they didn't do a great job, but they did a much better job uh, than the US in terms of controlling their mortality. And if you look at, you know, countries like Japan, which have even much older population. So, so they would, could be at a higher risk um, than the US. Uh, they have done a much better job, but the US had had a bad experience and this gap has widened in the vaccine era. So other countries, uh, you know, during the Omicron wave, uh, we have fallen way behind compared to our peers, compared to other high income countries. And we should all be concerned about this the reason is that if we don't make drastic changes, our vulnerability will continue longer than other countries, number one. Uh, the other part I would say is this doesn't pretend well for future, future pandemics. If anyone has any illusions that this will be the last pandemic uh, that the world is seeing at this scale, I think I, you know, they should set that aside because this is not the last pandemic. I can't say if it will be in the next five years or 10 years or 20 years or even 40 years, but we will see a pretty substantial pandemic uh, of, of, of a virus or, or, or perhaps another pathogen, uh, et cetera, as well. And the fact that uh, a year into the vaccination program, two years into a pandemic, our gap has only widened with countries that are comparable in terms of development and resources. If anything, we have more uh, money. And, and if anything, we have more, uh, you know, a higher number of uh, uh, healthcare and public health, trained public health professionals. Feel free to ask me a, a bit more about this, uh, other than the fact that one factor, but that's the only factor is the share of population fully vaccinated the US has the lowest share of, um, of, of, of the share of population fully vaccinated compared to other developed countries, especially large developed countries. There, there's some sort of smaller developed countries which have even higher rates of vaccination, but they're not a fair comparison. But even if you set them aside compared to other large developed countries, we have a lower share of uh, population fully vaccinated. But remember with Omicron, we need boosting and it's even worse uh, for uh, boosting. Uh, although Japan uh, is doing not as well for boosting, but they're doing very well for other things like masking and, and, and other measures. 
And so, so, so this is not a, a good picture. Uh, and there are several reasons for this, and I'll, I'll sort of come to you know, what we have been doing in terms of vaccine acceptance. But there is a bit of good news. Um, and the good news is that COVID has gradually uh, become less lethal over the pandemic, mainly due to immunity, but it remains, it's even now not like the flu. As someone who lives and breathes influenza uh, and used to do that before the pandemic, I, I didn't arrive at uh, the wonders of infectious diseases uh, when uh, you know pandemic related work became cool. Uh, I've been doing this work for ages. I've been working on influenza for the last couple of decades. Even now, it, this is not influenza. The infection fatality ratios, so meaning deaths per infection, are still higher uh, in this pandemic for COVID. But the good news is the trend looks good. And one of the, the most salient things that I'm looking forward to is the wider availability of treatment. There have been some really interesting progress in terms of treatment, especially early treatment of high-risk individuals. As, but, but, but it says, uh, you know, the way the, these treatments can be more effectively deployed is that if they're given early in the course of illness, and, and, and that would increase, the likelihood of that happening will increase as tests, including home-based tests, become increasingly available. So you test, and then if you are a high risk, New York is doing home deliveries of, of, of some of these drugs or will start that, but, but they have constrained supplies. And so they didn't, couldn't provide the full benefit during the Omicron wave uh, because the, they, they were recently licensed some of the newer drugs, the Pfizer has a drug, uh, Merck has a drug, uh, but, but, but as this becomes more widely available, you can treat people earlier on combined with testing, especially home-based testing, I, we, I expect this to go down um, further. And, and that's uh, good news. This is the national for forecast by CDC. Um, they do look at different various models, combine the assumptions, et cetera, and combine the output of the models. And this is the consensus forecast. And C CDC has been, you know, earlier on, it wasn't that on point, but, um, you know, for shorter time periods, the, it, I think it's it's reasonable to say that the, the, this is on point. Um, so in terms of new hospital admissions, we will continue to see the decline. And give me one second, let me connect my charger. We will continue to see a decline uh, through March. So that's good news. But deaths will continue to be substantial because as I said, there was a lag, um, uh, substantial through March, uh, through, through this whole month. So, so that's unfortunate. But then our big vulnerability, let me go back. So things will improve uh, through this spring, but our big vulnerability remains variants, uh, newer variants emerging. And there's a misconception that each new variant will be less severe. There's no guarantee that that will be the case. We do know that in order for a new variant to uh, take hold, it has to be more transmittable than the previous one. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it will necessarily be less severe. It can be less severe, but it can be more severe as well. Uh, this is how viruses evolve. And we play um, sort of, we are playing, uh, uh, you know, in a way a Russian roulette game with, uh, by, by letting, a huge chunk of the world's population go unvaccinated. The success, if, if there were any doubts in the fact that the success of the domestic disease control efforts depend on what is happening internationally, we, we should set those aside based on what happened with Omicron. And so the US is the most generous um, donator of vaccines, but that's because the other high income countries have done a worse job. It's not because <coughs> we are meeting the moment. And, uh, and it's not just uh, out of generosity that we should do that. It's, it should be smart strategy for self-preservation and preserving our domestic control efforts. So WHO uh, and then a couple of other entities like uh, 
uh, Davi um, uh, and a couple of other entities came together and they said that we will cre create this mechanism called COVAX to distribute vaccines, to pool the resources, uh, get some donations, get some vaccines, uh, both through donations, but also purchasing through uh, the funding they receive and give it to low-income countries. This struggled, this struggled hard throughout uh, 2021 <laughs> through early fall 2021 when uh, high-income countries uh, diverted supplies by make, placing these orders uh, earlier on before they could purchase them because they were starved of money throughout 2020. And when that happened, um, they couldn't deliver on their promises of distributing these vaccines. Finally, they got the money and finally they are distributing these vaccines, but they require up to 5 billion doses and that's minus boosters through uh, June uh, 2022. And they are now finally on track for getting there, but uh, not, uh, you know, they, they are big, uh, there have been major delays and uh, we now need boosters. So that supply may even need to be further increased. Uh, and, and as you can see, the doses, there's huge in inequity in where the doses are administered. So the, uh, the greener uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, what, what you have is that the more green it is, uh, the more um, doses that have been administered. So Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of South Asia remain a huge vulnerability. Uh, and that's, that's the big question mark. When and where does the next variant comes from? And, and you know, we remain unprepared. Uh, and, and we, our sort of research group did some really early work. We did uh, some mathematical models as early as 2020. And we showed that it is in high income countries own risk as they approach uh, some level of protection domestically to, to donate the doses aggressively to, to low income countries so that everyone's risk goes down. Um, and, and so the, the science has been there for a while, but unfortunately, um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of action. We have had, uh, we brought together at the Yale Institute for Global Health, a lot of partners to come up with a plan for global vaccine equity um, and, and created this doc technical document that, that was used for advocacy around vaccines. So and this ag <coughs> advocacy has moved the needle a bit, but not nearly enough. We've also been working on um, doing scientific experiments to see how we can persuade people so there's been good news and bad news. The good news is that there's a lot of a lot of interventions that we have evaluated that seem to work. But the bad news is that certain groups, for example, uh, you know, white evangelicals in the U.S., who used to be, you know, look very similar to other groups pre-pandemic in terms of vaccination. So it wasn't a political issue, or it's not an issue of a certain group, um, uh, you know, in terms of hesitancy before the pandemic. Uh, but COVID-19, they have had lower vaccine uptake, and we did certain interventions uh, in the fall. The study one <coughs> was done. And so if these bars cross the line, uh, th these interventions are not working. We did several interventions, and I'm not going to go into the details, and we found that some of these interventions were working in white evang evangelicals last fall. But then by May 2021, none of the interventions worked. Uh, part of the reason was that those who were persuadable had already been vaccinated, but then they also, uh, you know, it's a result of political polarization uh, in our society. And, and unfortunately, we needed new messages, et cetera. And so we have been working on that. <clears throat> Vaccine mandates have been used uh, to evaluate, to, to, to nudge uh, groups to have uh, vaccination. Uh, remember, a lot of these vaccines, these vaccine mandates are not draconian. What they say is that if you are getting vaccinated, you go ahead, get vaccinated and show us a proof of vaccination in, in terms of situations where you're interacting with other folks. But if you're not getting uh, vaccinated, go through extra testing. That's the most common quote unquote penalty, the extra work that you have to do. Um, you know, in a lot of these situations, penalties, which is all, never incarceration, which is never anything draconian, uh, yeah. is, you know, they are uh, sort of employment related things, uh, 
uh, that that in certain certain circumstances, you know, th there are implications for your uh, ongoing employment to be able to continue in in, you, in your position. But that's a lot of it is uh, uh, focused in healthcare uh, settings where you know unvaccinated folks present a risk to uh, others. But in several states have enacted interventions. Uh, related to COVID-19 vaccine mandates are preemptively either banned or facilitated in a limited number of cases, uh, either through executive orders or through laws, um, a, 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 you know, um, mandates. And unfortunately, you know, what we showed in this article in the Journal of the American Medical Association was that the there's been an onslaught of uh, of, of legal interventions to restrict mandates, handicapping um, uh, states and jurisdictions ability to have even sort of these kinds of things where you either vaccinate or, um, uh, or get extra testing. We have been working globally with UNICEF, Facebook and a couple of other partners to actually do, uh, deliver messaging, uh, countering misinformation through social media, we have done 27 campaigns in the last few uh, week, uh, months. We are doing uh, other randomized trials. Uh, for example, a 250 district trial in um, India, uh, a country level trial, randomized trial of messaging around vaccines, COVID vaccines in Ukraine, and so on and so forth. So we continue to be engaged and, uh, and we have learned some lessons and this was a bit of an example. We also have been focusing on making sure that doctors and nurses have not just the uh, information on the science of COVID-19 vaccines that they can give their uh, patients, but also communication tools. So we have a communication training uh, at uh, four physicians at approximately, uh, physician nurses, approximately 4,000 uh, individuals have claimed that credit. So the con continued me medical education or continued nursing education credits uh, through the Yale Medicine side, we have created that module, um, and and this is the module, and and it has received a lot of feedback. So empowering um, physicians and nurses, because we know that healthcare providers remain the single most trusted source of vaccine information throughout the world, including the U.S. And we have developed other tools in collaboration with UNICEF and WHO here at the Yale Institute for Global Health. Uh, first, we did the, in 2020, as early as 2020, we developed a vaccine misinformation management guide uh, to counter, uh, use evidence-based approaches to counter misinformation, so, and it can be downloaded. It's now in five languages. Um, we have a vaccine messaging guide uh, for social media that we work uh, on with uh, UNICEF as well as Facebook uh, to for you know and and, and the, one of the reasons we we collaborated with facebook is because they know social media better than we do uh to how to do evidence-based messaging uh, in, on social media and that's the guide a lot of these organizations used and, and, and several dozen countries use now and then we have uh, another uh tools kit that is being pushed out to various countries and, and domestically eventually various localities this is for the whole world uh in terms of what other interventions jurisdiction jurisdictions can do for uh, vaccination related work. So I covered some of the things uh, that we have been doing and the snapshot around vaccines uh, and vaccine uptake uh, here at the Yale Institute for Global Health and Schools of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, et cetera. We are working on a lot of other things, immunology of vaccine response, vaccine effectiveness uh, and so on and so forth. But I didn't cover it today because uh, you know uh, I just wanted to keep this focused and brief, but would be happy to answer questions of uh, around what else we have been up to. Thank you, Dr. Omer. Uh, we are, so uh, I have given everyone the ability to unmute themselves. Um, we have uh, about 15 minutes for Q and A. So if you'd like to ask a question, you can go ahead and ask it. Unmute yourself and ask, you can raise your hand. I can call you if there's a queue or you can put your question in the chat. Uh, Martin Torres Quintero, you are first. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, good morning, doctor. Good morning, everybody. I have a question. Can you share some information about the possibility of utilizing a pill 
to administer a vaccine and how will that impact um, uh, the course of this pandemic? That's an interesting question. So we have administered vaccines orally. Usually they are done through drops, uh, liquid form, but you know, pills have been um, evaluated sort of under experimental conditions, uh, et cetera. Um, it, right now, the products that are in the, but, but, but there are advantages, certainly there are advantages in terms of delivery, et cetera. Uh, it's easier to deliver oral vaccines uh, and compared to uh, injectable vaccines. But there are trade-offs in terms of where you need the, the antigen to be there, uh, to, to be available in your body and a high quality immune response. That doesn't mean it's not possible. And there are a few experimental products going in that direction, uh, oral delivery. And the first will be liquid and then sort of people uh, are, like other vaccines, exploring other ways of delivering it, but it's 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 uh, you know it'll take some time to for us to get there. However, the next alternative route where lots of folks are focusing, and some of my colleagues at Yale are focusing, is the intranasal route, uh, because the, the the infection happens in that kind of a region and in that mucosa, and so therefore it is attractive at least as a booster dose to prevent not just severe disease, but to have high quality response against all infection is the holy grail. Uh, and this is where a lot of scientists are going. So I think it, for alternative routes to intramuscular injections, the, the first initial focus is intranasal, and then there are other things that are sort of in, in very early stages. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Omar. Uh, next is Michelle. Sorry. Um, doctor, you talked about the vulnerability uh, of more variants. Um, is it going to be sort of like the flu? You're getting a, you know, you're having to get a shot, at, you know, um, every year. And does that mean that we will be wearing masks indefinitely? And yes, there are people who are not vaccinated. You don't know who they are. How vulnerable are you if you're the if you have had all of your vaccinations and your booster? Really good questions. Uh, it does look like that we will need at least a couple of more boosters uh, of this. Uh, the early data suggests uh, that that we will need a couple of more boosters. I, I and and scientists are trying their best to make sure that they are not less free, uh, they're not more frequent than annual boosters. So, so there is really careful because, you know, everyone is exhausted. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the vaccine system itself, we burden the healthcare system a lot to deliver, uh, you know, you know, these doses and even booster dose coverage is not the, the first booster dose coverage is not stellar in the US. Uh, so, so folks are looking at options so that even if we have to do a booster, it's an annual booster. Fr frankly, as a trade-off, an annual bo booster that you get used to is not the end of the is not the end of the world mm -hmm. uh, compared to the tr those trade-offs. The second part about it, I, I hope not that we. I hope we don't have to wear. You know, some people. Th there are two things. First of all, I think we should destigmatize voluntary wearing of masks. If someone wants to wear a mask. You know, let them wear a mask, etc., and you know, have high quality mask available based on their own risk and perception of risk. Uh, but in in terms of sort of standardizing wearing of masks or even sort of mandating in limited situations, my hope is that it's not. And and there are signs that it 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 may not uh, it uh, that it will not be a permanent situation, um, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, and. The reason I'm saying that is uh, we are slowly building population level immunity uh, through vaccination and unfortunately through um, uh, through infection as well. But again, new variants tend to avoid uh, previous immunity, just like influenza. You have to have to do that. So there's a bit of a balance. But we don't wear a mask against influenza. We are not quite there yet. So at this point, when there are 2,500 deaths happening. This is not the time to take off your mask. Uh, 
et cetera. But we will get there. Uh, we will get to a situation where we can safely take off our masks. First of all, you know, no need to wear a mask outside uh, now. Uh, we will be, unless you are in a, in a situation where you're really tightly packed, and, and the example I give, at least to my students, that you're out in an outdoor concert uh, is the kind of situation where you need a mask, uh, where you're sort of literally packed like sardines uh, in, in that kind of a situation. Less than that, um, you know, you're probably okay with without an outdoor mask. Um, but in terms of you know going forward, uh, I think we will have it slowly. It, it will go down the need for masks in all situations or most situations. Uh, but again, voluntary masks. I think we should destigmatize. De Everyone has their own risk. Um, you know, in, in Asia, a lot of people wear masks uh, for pollution, allergies, and when they're sick. For example, if there are any respiratory illness, so I, th I think that kind of a situation is different from everyone having to wear a mask. So, in terms of if someone, if you don't know who is vaccinated, your personal risk is substantially low, uh, even now, in terms of severe disease. If you have had uh, boosters, especially. But having said that, the reason why at this point masks are still recommended, we have a variant that is spreading very quickly. And even if you don't get sick yourself, or even, although there are chances of getting sick, but they are much lower than unvaccinated, much, much lower than unvaccinated, but they're not still not influenza. Remember, I showed you that chart. It's still not influenza. It's better than, much better than before, but it's still not influenza. But also because we don't want a situation that hospitals get overwhelmed, that even if you don't, get sick yourself and you're transmitting to others, um, hospitals, when hospitals get overwhelmed, heart attacks don't get the same level of attention, for example, uh, even if they have not, nothing to do with uh, COVID, et cetera. So, so those are the things. When the wave goes down, things can relax a little bit more. As you will see, institutions will go back to uh, gatherings, et cetera, with, with more people. Um, and so on and so forth. So, so that's the situation. In the long run, I think we will return to a new normal uh, and we will return to a situation that we are, we are with care, uh, a lot of similar activities can be resumed. Even this fall, I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm a, I'm a theater nerd and, mm -hmm. uh, and I went to New York and watched my shows uh, with uh, you know, friends and family uh, and uh, there was, they were checking vaccine uh, proof of vaccination mm -hmm. and they had masks and there's no evidence of any major outbreaks in the audience um, during that period when they did that. With Omicrons, there were some cast outbreaks. They had to cancel a few things, but not uh, um, sort of audience outbreaks. So these things can be manageable and slowly as the things become normal, as the population immunity goes up, remember, Countries that have had higher vaccination rates have had lower death rates. So if we get to that place, we can have a lot of things relaxed. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. And we did have that. And, and this virus is becoming increasingly seasonal as it happens with pandemic viruses. The mm -hmm. circular, they're less seasonal uh, during the first few years, but then they become more seasonal. The highs and lows become more pr pronounced as uh, more people develop immunity. Thank you. Uh, so last three questions, two are in the chat. Uh, the first is, what is the global vaccine hesitancy rate? Is it comparable to the US? That's a really good question. Um, we measured it uh, in 12 countries, uh, including US and Russia and 10 low and middle income countries right before the commencement of the immunization program globally, right before vaccines were deployed. And we found that in low and middle income countries, invariably the vaccine uh, acceptance or uh, acceptance was higher than US, the US and Russia. But look, they have had a year of no vaccine on minimal vaccines in a lot of especially low income countries. Middle income countries have been able to procure some uh, doses. And when you have that, countries cannot invest in vaccine education. So remember in this country, we threw money at um, and, and rightfully so, at education, at these campaigns. And we did a lot of hard work with communities 
uh, on, on that with a lot of needed hard work on sort of building confidence. These countries, country after country last year, I uh, told me and, and folks told me that we cannot have too heavily invest in demand because if we if our demand uh, outstrips our supply, we're going to have other problems. So they, they were in that situation where they, the population was getting all these rumors. They were getting other reasons to suspect vaccines and they could not invest in increasing acceptance of vaccines because they didn't want the, the demand to outstrip, outstrip supply. So the new data, they started in a better position, but over a year they, they got hit so hard with these kinds of things without being able to mount a defense against misinformation and disinformation. Uh, that the situation is not comparably as rosy. And even at that time, we saw that there was room for improvement, pretty substantial room for improvement. It's just that they were better than the US and Russia. So, so that's the situation right now. As the supply improves, there will need to be investments in similar kind of investments that we did in this country on vaccine acceptance uh, interventions, as well as vaccine supply. Thank you. Uh, the next question, can you speak on how we might need to be thinking of this now as an endemic and not a pandemic and how we might next move forward? Yeah, so we will get to an endemic situation. But right now, when we have a surge of 2,500 people dying, at least this is not an endemic yet. And even at the endemic levels, uh, sometimes, you know, TB is endemic globally, but it's a pretty substantial 1.5 million people die every year. Of TB, so that doesn't mean that it is goes away as a problem, but it does mean that it is at a level that doesn't impact our, you know, in various countries and varies from country to country, doesn't impact our daily lives. So it's people like me who have to worry about it uh, on a daily basis. It's not, you know, uh, your your grandmother uh, doesn't have to wake up thinking about this the, the stupid pandemic every morning. Uh, so, so it will get to that, uh, and, but it is not there yet. Uh, so so that, that's the answer. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, you mentioned the Johnson & Johnson vaccine earlier. Uh, what would you recommend for people who've had one Johnson & Johnson dose and a Pfizer booster? Is that enough for now? Well, here's the thing. So I discourage people from freelancing, um, et cetera. Hey, talk to your doctor. Uh, doctors have, with the full licensure of vaccines, they have more flexibility. And based on your risk, et cetera, they might give uh, additional dose. They can now give, uh, you know, go beyond the, the recommendations because they are not just emergency use vaccines. They're, the mRNA vaccines are now um, uh, fully authorized. Uh, so I can't comment on sort of a specific you know, case, but generally speaking, I do think that CDC should move to uh, a, a two additional dose, um, uh, at least two additional dose after a Johnson Johnson vaccine. So the same number of doses you get for a Moderna schedule with booster. Uh, so I think there is value in moving to that. And I do think CDC should make that recommendation. Thanks. And another question. What do we know about the new variant rising in South Africa? Um, the BA2 subvariant? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, they may. They, they, they didn't submit. Heather, you may want to um, unmute if you'd like to, to further yeah. respond to your question. Yes, that, the, that new yeah. version of the P1, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so there's some concern, but there's uh, reassuring news there as well. So just to, just to give uh, everyone sort of an update on this, within Omicron, uh, there has been some identification of a variant that is um, uh, a, a sub-variant uh, called BA2. There are other names for it as well, depending on how you sort of different tax taxonomy schemes. Uh, that has taken over very quickly countries like Denmark. And we do know the emerging data suggests there are a few things uh, that the emerging data suggests. One thing that we, we know more definitively uh, that it is in a lot of countries like Denmark and India, it's spreading more efficiently. So the efficiency of spread, so it's an effectivity is higher than uh, the garden variety Omicron. Uh, and as the kids say, the OG Omicron virus. Uh, so based on that, we, 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 we know that it spreads more efficiently, but, but the, uh, the infectivity gap 
is not as much as Omicron has with Delta. So it's slightly more infectious. Uh, so, so that's one thing. The, the reassuring news is so far, we haven't seen an increase of severity of disease caused by this new subvariant. That's number one. The, the second reassuring news is the vaccine, the same level of effectiveness you have of the three dose. Obviously, two doses don't work as well for Omicron, the, the original Omicron, uh, and three doses work. These three doses work as well, the initial data suggests, against B, uh, BA2. So I think it's the bottom line is that's something the general public uh, doesn't necessarily have to worry about at this time. It's something that people like myself need to keep an eye on uh, and sort of alert if there is something more cause for concern. I, ho I hope that answers your question. Thank you. That was the last question I see. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Omar, for joining us again this year. Very informative. I will um, put Dr. Omer's, um, I will send out Dr. Omer's website. Actually, you can look him up at us. Uh, S-A-A-D-O-M-E-R. Um, he has a, a great web page. You can also reach out to um, his office, I'm sure, with any questions. So thanks again. Uh, and thank you all for joining us uh, this month. I hope to see you at next month's breakfast. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Omer. <laughs>